uncomfortable learning, free speech, open-mindedness, intellectual growth, and controversy. Over the last two years, I've discussed all of these notions in relation to uncomfortable learning. Uncomfortable learning is a student group at Williams College, and I'm the president. What uncomfortable learning strives to do is broaden the range of dialogue on campus, to broaden the range of political discourse, and to challenge students to engage with perspectives that are not just uncomfortable, but that are often very unsettling. Perspectives that many of us might find odious. Perspectives that some of my peers have found denigrating and dehumanizing. But why? In my time as president of Uncomfortable Learning, I've invited several speakers to campus, two of whom have been disinvited. One of them was an anti-feminist. The other has been described by many as a racist and white supremacist. As a black Democrat, as someone who considers myself a progressive, as someone who wants social change, as someone who admires Barack Obama and the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., why am I inviting these speakers? Why do I believe in uncomfortable learning? For me, uncomfortable learning has a lot to do with finding out what matters to people and why. Uncomfortable learning is about realizing that humanity does not just encompass the things that we like, the things that we admire. Uncomfortable learning is about understanding that humanity also involves the things that we despise, the things that we love, the things that we hope we can change through building understanding, through pushing our social change, and through struggle. As president of Uncomfortable Learning, I've encountered many difficulties. I've had peers who've come up to me and they've said, Zach, I don't think you understand. For me, this, this speaker that you're bringing, it's not just about intellectual growth. It's not just about intellectual development. This is personal for me. As an African American from a disadvantaged background, I've had to overcome many trials and tribulations and many obstacles to get to Williams College. And more than anything, I want to believe that as Barack Obama said before he got elected as President of the United States, we are not as divided as our politics suggests. If I want to have faith in that creed, that means that I can never give up on trying to understand how I can use knowledge as a force for good. I see nothing to gain from hiding, from saying that because this belief, because this set of views, because these attitudes, whether they're about the relationship between race and IQ, which is something that a speaker I brought named Charles Murray uh, posited as his main argument, whether it's about questioning the number of sexual assaults that happen on college campuses, whether it's about questioning the place of women in society, I'm not bringing these speakers because I agree with them. I'm not bringing these speakers because it would be easy for me to be friends with them. It's very difficult for me to bring these speakers. But I'm doing it because I believe that there is value in exposing what is wrong. There is value in saying, this is what an individual in a pluralistic democratic society has to say. And this is why I do not believe that we should go forward with this understanding of the world. As president of Uncomfortable Learning, I have tried to explain that oftentimes what we feel, what we think, and what we believe about the world is shaped by the sources that we rely on for information. To explain one dichotomy, we're both familiar with MSNBC and Fox News. If you listen to Fox News, you're often receiving facts and information presented in a way that align with a conservative bias. When you listen to MSNBC, you're often receiving and listening to information that aligns with more of a liberal bias. Personally, I certainly favor MSNBC. But what is the value of watching Fox. A lot of people find Bill O'Reilly entertaining. 
I find it very difficult to listen to what he has to say sometimes. But I still listen and I still tune in because I want to understand how to articulate differences of opinion, how to expose and identify the flaws in arguments, how to persuade and convince people that this is not the person that you should be listening to, this is not the example that you should follow. This is not the set of values and beliefs that guide us toward moral progress and human advancement. Another dichotomy can be seen between the perspective of two individuals on taxes. Thomas Sowell is an economist. This view of taxation aligns with an understanding of the world that says you have to lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. That if you have enough individual initiative, if you have enough determination, if you understand what it means to be in a meritocratic, democratic society, you'll get ahead. It's not the responsibility of anyone who is doing well for themselves to help you out. It's about you. It's about what you can do for yourself. This is a belief that is rooted in a certain kind of moral psychology. And there are a number of social scientists who have explained this. Jonathan Haidt is one who's written a book called The Righteous Mind that I highly recommend. In the book, he explains that morals are different for liberals and conservatives. That oftentimes, liberals and conservatives have different moral psychologies that ground their beliefs. And that sometimes, the truth is not about being heavily for or against something, but understanding that there is an understanding in between. But this is difficult for them. When it comes to an issue like affirmative action, when it comes to an issue like welfare, when it comes to an issue like Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, health care, I support these things. I understand them as social programs, as legislation, as measures that are taken to enhance the quality of life of individuals who are not at the table, who do not have a voice. Thomas Sowell has studied these things. But he sees society in a very different way. How do we ensure that we are able to create the change that we want? It's very difficult to achieve change on a national scale. And talking with a number of my peers, I've realized that sometimes you have to say that the change that you want to achieve more broadly has to begin with something more personal. A peer once said to me that you can't always change an entire community, but what you can do is change the interactions that you have within that community. And I believe that uncomfortable learning is something that is very useful in trying to achieve that goal. It may be difficult to convince an entire audience of conservatives of why they should consider more thoughtfully liberal values, liberal policies, liberal measures, why they should consider the critical importance of empathy and kindness and compassion, and why these elemental values are critical for the advancement of society. But it has to start somewhere. It has to start saying, it has to start with saying to someone, what matters to you and why? How else can you find common ground? How else can you strive to achieve mutual understanding? How else can you reach a closer approximation of the truth that is often messy and complicated? So while I vehemently disagree with Thomas Sowell on 93% of all political questions that we could possibly be asked, <laughs> I try my best to read his work, to engage with it critically, to reflect on it, to think about how, if I were sitting at a table with him, I would articulate our differences of opinion. Not how I could just persuade him, but how if I had the opportunity, I could demonstrate to a group of people why it is and what's actually better for society. 
is not what he's proposing in terms of taxation, but something very different. To show the counterpoint, this is Warren Buffett. Most of us know who he is. He's one of the wealthiest men in the world. Yet, his view on taxation is very different. He believes that the rich should help the poor. They should pay a greater share in taxes. I happen to agree with this view more. But for people who do agree with this view, I would encourage them to engage with the counter party and vice versa. A recent study that was conducted by the Pew Research Center looked at how millennials and Americans in general receive information and how they qualify that information and interpret it. And what this study showed is that social media and news websites are the most common pathways for people to take in information about what's going on in the world, particularly as it relates to current events. And so what does this mean for millennials? for students on college campuses that are my age. For one, it means that because we have things like Facebook, you can like the Wall Street Journal, or like the New York Times, or like the Weekly Standard, or the National Review, or the Nation, or Mother Jones. And you can set up a system in which all of the information that's on your news feed are things you agree with. Those are the things you like, those are the things you comment on. Everything else you ignore, everything else you block, Everything else, you know, people say things that you don't like and you get tired of hearing it, so you unfriend them. I've seen it happen time and time again. So when I talk to my peers who say, why are you bringing these speakers to campus, one thing that I try to convey to them is that I believe that college is the place in which we should try our very best to push our intellectual limits to challenge ourselves to step outside of our own subject position, to try to understand how it is that we can make the most compelling arguments, the most compelling cases. And that, is, that involves understanding how we receive information, how we imbibe information, and how we use it. There's a concept that's been around in psychology for a while now called confirmation bias. And it essentially means that we look for information that we can use to support what we already think and feel about the world. And then we take that information and we roll with it. We run with it. We ignore everything else. If I read the New York Times or the Washington Post every day, I don't pay attention to what's in the Wall Street Journal or what's in the National Review or what's in the Weekly Standard. But I think that sometimes to make that change on an individual level, to see if you can possibly reach one individual and help them understand why there's another way of seeing the world, why there's another way of approaching social problems like inequality, racial equality, gender equality, sexism, is by saying to them, I see where you're coming from. I don't agree with many of the sources that you rely on and read daily, but I've engaged with them. Here are my thoughts. And here's where I think we might be able to relate. Here's where I think we might be able to work together. Because very few people will tell you that they're not for a more just world. They just have different versions of what they believe that world should look like. That is how I have described and defended my work with Uncomfortable Learning over the last two years. But what I want to leave you with today goes far beyond any moral or political disagreement. The story I want to share with you today is one that I've never shared publicly before. It's about my mother. At its core, uncomfortable learning is about facing the facts and beliefs that underpin the world you live in. I know this because in fourth grade, I began researching schizophrenia. When I was seven, my mom was hospitalized and diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, a mental health condition that's characterized by symptoms of schizophrenia and bipolar. Throughout my childhood, my mom suffered daily from mood swings and paranoid delusions, but she never told anyone about how her illness affected her as a mom. While my mom loved me, 
and taught me the importance of eye contact and a firm handshake and putting my best foot forward. Some of my earliest memories are of nights where I went to sleep hoping that I would not wake up in the morning. Because of her illness, my mother's behavior was often unpredictable. And when she was angry, her rage was terrifying. As a child, it was very, very difficult to deal with. Today, I think about my mom. I think about how she's doing. I think about the fact that we haven't talked as often or as frequently as I would like to. When I was 14, Child Protective Services took me out of my mother's custody. And I went to DC to live with my dad. I did not talk to my mom for months. Almost half a year went by. And I didn't know if she would ever be able to understand why I decided to tell someone about the things that I was dealing with at home. But I decided to give her a call one day. Our conversation was short, it was tense, and it was very stressful. But the next day, she sent me a text message apologizing for her refusal to acknowledge many of the things that had happened in the past. She ended her message by asking, can we put the past behind us? and work on mending our relationship as mother and son. At that time, I never thought that she would apologize. I never thought that my mom would admit to any degree of wrongdoing. And I didn't think that I would be in a place where I would be able to receive her words even if she did. After my mom made that apology, our relationship improved. It's not perfect. Like I said, I wish we talked more frequently, and I wish there were certain things that we could discuss that we can't. But progress never comes without setbacks and without challenges. Working through my understanding of my relationship with my mom has been uncomfortable, even painful. But it has challenged me to believe even under the toughest of circumstances, and the potential of people to be better than they are, beyond winning an argument or being able to deconstruct a complicated issue. I believe that progress and change are fundamentally related to believing, even when it's difficult, that understanding is always possible. Thank you. Thank you.